Good morning. It's great to see you all here. It's great to see the little ones uh, here as, as well. Um, I was happy that, that my granddaughter, Elena, wasn't bothered by all the masks. She just thinks it's kind of normal. And so uh, that, was, that was fun to see her kind of gallivanting ar uh, around and uh, enjoying herself and to see everybody's faces here. Earlier this week, Malcolm uh, sent um, the staff a, a video just of interest. It was uh, um, so interesting to me that I actually posted it on uh, my Facebook page. I don't actually usually do that. If any of you are connected, you know, I'm not a big poster uh, period, let alone uh, uh, videos and stuff like that. But I found this one interesting um, because it was two American uh, or two, two folks talking about American uh, football and whether or not um, athletes had the right to choose whether to, to kneel or even to choose whether or not to stand. Uh, and uh, they were having this discussion. There's two commentators, Jason Bell and Asi Amanyinora. Um, both happened to be men of color, and they were, they were talking about this. Jason started, and he said because it, you know, he had viewed firsthand some of the injustices that had uh, happened, that uh, as a man of color, he, he would feel compelled. He has to use his voice, he said, uh, at the appropriate time. He believed it was appropriate time uh, to say, hey, this is, this is wrong. And, and then the, the guy kind of going between the two asked and said, well, you know, what do you think to Ossie? And, and uh, Ossie said, well, he said, I, I, um, I could not kneel. And then he said, the reason is, he says, is I'm, I'm from Nigeria. And he says, when we look at the United States, that's the land of opportunity. He says, and that's where I, where I came from. And they're, and they're watching. And, and when I came, everything that America promised, he said, it delivered. I worked hard and I'm living, I'm living the dream. And he says, it would be hypocrisy for me to kneel. Now, what I loved about this is that these two gentlemen had opposing views. But when they were working out, each listened to the other. And then they both said, hey, that's fine. You have the right to kneel. And yeah, that's great. I can understand you standing. I just thought it was a fabulous example of how the conversation should be like. The other thing um, that I would uh, highlight, especially this morning, is that uh, Ossie had, he, he didn't necessarily say, hey, I haven't seen what you've seen at all, Jason. As a matter of fact, he has seen it. He understands that, that, that at, at, at times there has been injustice, that, that some folks in some places um, have judged people wrongly, treated people unfairly, uh, seemingly because of the color of their skin. Uh, however, because of where he was from, Nigeria, he had a completely different perspective, a completely different uh, 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 lens, if you would, that he was looking at the whole issue through. And in essence, um, that is what we're going to be talking about for the next six weeks. We're actually going to be joining over 20 other churches that have either taught this series or are teaching this series. A bunch of churches got together four months or so ago, or pastors, I should say, and, and we began to have a discussion of, um, of unity and the tough time that our country is having and, and what would it look like for churches, for followers of Jesus all over the Bay Area to come together and each pastor with you know uh, each church with their own little flavor, but basically talk about the fact that we are not first and foremost of this kingdom. We are the kingdom of God. And everything that we do, we are also, by the way, citizens of this kingdom as well. But our first allegiance, the lens that we look at this world through is the lens of the kingdom of God. And so our purpose in the next six weeks isn't to identify our identity as Americans or immigrants, or ethnic group, or even actually of members of Trinity Church, but rather, what does it mean to be a member of the kingdom of God? That Jesus is the king, 
And because of that, we view the world differently. We may see the same events, but we view the world differently. Now, in order to accomplish this task, we're going to trace this theme of kingdom um, throughout the scriptures from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So, you know, we have a lot of ground to cover. We won't obviously cover everything, but we, we want to see how the kingdom is developed and looked at all throughout scripture. So, of course, we're going to start this morning in the beginning. In the beginning, God created. He created. That's one of the great things about meeting outside, even though we're competing with a plane or two every now and again, is we we can visually see the the tree and, and the small tree behind me and the bushes and the beauty that God created. But as most important creation is, as impressive as this is, as impressive as the mountains and the beach and the deserts after a rain are, that's nothing compared to his greatest creation, which was you and me. In Genesis 1, 27 through 28, it says this, So God created man, that's the word Adam, mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So the first thing to understand is that we were created, you were created in the image of God. And the, and the other interesting thing about it is, is that God could not create just one person to reflect his image. He had to create two. That's the basis of our our faith is, is, is God is one. But within the one, there's a relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all God. But there's one. And so when he created someone to, to reflect his being, it says he created them. Male and female. And that's hugely important. I mean, it, it, for the rest of the world, they, I can understand where they, they see the world through what we would call tribal eyes. They see the world, we're Americans, we're Chinese, we're Russian, we're black, we're white, we're from the north, we're from the south. We're from the East, we're from the West, we're Niner fans, we're Seattle fans, we're fill in the blank. But for those that that are part of the kingdom of God, that's not the lens we look through. We look through the lens that Adam and Eve, who is the mother and father of every human being on the planet, bore the image of the almighty God. And so whatever camp you're in, blue, red, north, south, east, west, whatever color you may be, whatever, you bear the image of God. And that is our worldview. And as such, every human being, every human being should be treated as such. Secondly, this passage points out that God gave people something to do. He just didn't create them and say, ah, just relax, I got it. He created them with something to do, and it was them. This is, in in essence, a couple's project. I don't know how many of you ever went through premarital counseling or maybe went to a marriage retreat, but every once in a while they're like, okay, the two of you need to work on this together. And that's exactly what God says to Adam and Eve. I got a couple's project for you. You need to do this in relationship. And and there's two basic ideas here. Fill the earth. Fill it. And secondly, subdue it or manage it well. But they are to do it together. Not just one, but together. As a a matter of fact, the whole idea of, of Eve was azir. That's the word that's used, a helpmate. Doesn't mean second, doesn't mean, you know, to do what I don't want to do. 
it, it's a compliment. As a matter of fact, the word is used most often of God himself. He is our azir. He is our compliment. He is the one that gives us strength to do what we cannot do on our own. They are to do this with one purpose. And here's my first big point, if you would. We were created with a shared purpose, specifically to bless the world. So if you, if you look at the, the verse here, it says, uh, and God blessed them and said to them. In other words, God says, man, I'm going to bless you, and then this is part of my blessing for you. Part of my blessing for you is you're not just two lumps on a log. Part of my blessing for you is you're not alone. Part of my blessing for you is that you're, you're going to have a family and you're going to grow. Fill the earth and subdue it. Go be a blessing. Go do something and make it positive. We were created with a shared purpose and it was to bless the world. Bless means to give benefit, to show favor especially on the basis of relationship. And as God blesses us, He's given us something to do to go bless the world. And one of my pastoral friends, Paul Taylor of Peninsula Bible Church, this is one of his favorite definitions of politics, is building a shared life together. Building a shared life together. Politics is a dynamics which takes place when people try to build a shared life together. Now, it can be good or it can be bad. In the best way, it's a positive where people work together to build a shared life together. In this way, it happens in families. Politics happens in families. It, it happens in companies. It happens in educational institutions. It happens... When four cars all come to the stop sign at the same time. And believe it or not, politics happens in the church. I know that's hard to believe, huh? But politics is just a way to describe the process, hopefully positively, of working together to build a shared life together. And this is where it started. These two people working together together to build a shared life. All seemed well, but unfortunately, it did not last. Instead of working together to fulfill their purpose, most of you all know what happens in the very next chapter. An enemy comes into the picture. An enemy who had long rejected his relationship with God wanted to, in essence, sit on the throne himself. He was cast out of uh, heaven and wanting to take as many folks with him, he approaches both Adam and Eve. And he gets them to begin to question their purpose. Did God say, can you really trust God's word? And they both decided, well, maybe not. Maybe God's trying to keep us Something good from us. By the way, that's the num one of the number one ways to get you to vote for someone and against someone else. It doesn't matter what side you're on. You just tell them, you know, they're trying to keep you. They're just trying to keep it from themselves. It still works today. And then, and then what do we see right away? Bad politics. They, not only do they sin, but when God shows up, what happens? Right? You shift the blame. This is classic politics. You shift the blame. Adam, what happened? Well, it's the woman you gave me. It's her fault. If she didn't have such bad policies. Go to the woman. What, 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 what do you have to say for yourself? Oh, it was the serpent. It was him. He's so crafty. I didn't really want to. My hands were tied. And, we, and what we see right now is this brokenness. We see the blame game. And the rest of the book of Genesis is filled with the story. Time and time again, families divided, husbands divided against wives, children against parents. But most of all, 
brother against brother. Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, and of course the first and most famous, Cain and Abel. Where Cain and Abel both bring a gift out of relationship to God, but but one is well thought out, it seems, and, and is pure of heart, and the other one is not. It doesn't really describe it a whole lot, what the problem was. But God just simply says, hey, you could do better. That's all he says. Sin's crouching at the door. But rather than working better, he's decided, you know, there's a better way to take care of this problem. I'll just take care of my competition. I'll just get rid of my competition. Can you see the politics? We're not even out of, the, we're not even out of Genesis yet. And he kills his brother. He murders him. And this is exactly what we see today. Tony Dungy, an ex-football player and coach, also a man of color, in May of this year when things were going crazy, he put out this tweet. He says this. He says, today we are a divided country. We're divided racially, politically, socioeconomically, and Satan, he says, is laughing at us because that's exactly what he wants. Dysfunction, mistrust, and hatred help his kingdom flourish. It's what he did at the very beginning. It's what he's been doing ever since. Because that's what sin does. That's what evil does. We turn against each other in division. And because of that, our efforts, our call, if you would, to bless others, to help the kingdom flourish, does not happen. And that's our second point. First of all, remember, we were created with a shared purpose to bless the world. But secondly, sin, my sin, your sin, divides us and thwarts our purpose. Instead of working together to bless the world, we argue with each other. We argue with each other and we forget about our responsibility to the world. Right? The higher call isn't what my country can do for me. You remember that dream when, we, when the president stepped up and he had the audacity to say, stop asking what I can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country. Ask how you can be a blessing. Now, we shouldn't be surprised by this, but we should be deeply grieved by it. Deeply grieved by it. Especially that we, God's people, are falling for one of the oldest tricks of the book from the enemy who wants to make us ineffective. But there is hope. We know there's hope. There is a, there is a silver lining. Because, because even though this is human history, God is still in control. God is still God. So we kind of go jump, if you would, to the end of the last major story in the book of Genesis. It actually begins the way the rest of the book is, very badly. Joseph's the young, youngest of 12 brothers. And when it says in verse 23, when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. The richly ornamented robe he was wearing was a symbol of his love of his dad. They were all jealous. And again, the object is to get rid of the one they're jealous of. Hasn't changed. And they took him and they threw him into a sister. And the cistern was empty and there was no water. And they intended to kill him. But one of the brothers goes, maybe this isn't one out of ten that was out there at that time. He says, maybe this isn't a good idea. And he says, you know, we don't want his blood on our hands. And he tries to buy some time so maybe he can sneak him back to his dad. And the others say, okay. And then, and then they begin to talk and go, you know what? We can kill two birds with one stone. Verse 28, so when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and they sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. They got rid of their brother and made a profit. Woohoo! Now, this was a human story. This was a, a political story. This would probably be the end. But it's not. 
This is God's people. Or those who are soon to become his people. And so really quickly, he goes down to Egypt as a slave. He sold a Potiphar, a leader in Egypt. He manages that house really well. And then something, a lie comes out. Politics again. He ends up in prison. But guess what? He ends up managing at the prison. He does a really good job. Then he ends up in front of Pharaoh himself. Interprets a dream. And because of his experience, he says, well, this is what I would do to manage his project. And Pharaoh says, great idea. Let's do that. Now, I just summarized about 20 some odd chapters for you. His brothers show up because they need food because of this famine. And there's a little cat and mouse that happened, but ultimately he reveals himself. His family moves to Egypt, and rather than starving uh, back in Judah, or the area that they were at the time, which was the area of Judah, they come to Egypt, they live through the famine, his family is spared. The father dies, and the brothers begin to freak out because they know Joseph's about to get them now. Because politically speaking, he had to be nice when dad was around, but now he's not beholden to that and he is the second in command over all of Egypt and now they are in trouble and according to the political game they are due what is due this isn't their story it's not even Joseph's story it's God's story in Genesis 45 verse 4 through 7 it says this then Joseph said to his brothers come close to me come to me like brothers And when they'd done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. See, he sees another story because he's looking through a different lens. For two years now, there was famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will now not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives to be a great deliverance. So one man, I want you to notice, has drawn together a group of brothers. He's united them as one. He doesn't only unite them, he also restores their purpose. Let me remind you of their purpose. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, and these are Jacob's 12 sons. It all begins with Abram. And in chapter 12 of Genesis, God comes to Abram with this theme of blessing again. And he says this in the first few verses of chapter 12. So the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. I'm showing you, I'm, I'm taking you to a foreign land that's not yours. He's going to be an alien in a foreign land. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. But you also are going to be a blessing. Verse 3 then. And I will bless those who bless you. And, I will, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples. All peoples. On earth. Will be blessed through you. You see to, to, the, to the eye of everybody else. This is just one family that screwed up like every other family. And they, and they, and they sell off a, a, a brother. And that's either the end of the story or later on the brother turns out to have some power so the story should end like he gets his revenge. But this isn't a human story. It's not about this kingdom. It's about the heavenly kingdom. And the heavenly kingdom, God had a family to preserve. And so he uses this situation to restore things. So we were created with a shared purpose to bless the world and our sin divides us and thwarts our purpose. But the third big point, God will unite us and restore our purpose. That's his plan. 
And I don't miss this. You see what God does in the life of Joseph. The story of the kingdom of God involves one man uniting brothers and sisters together and restoring them to their original purpose to bless the world. That is exactly what Joseph does by the end of Genesis. And this is what Jesus, Yeshua, God saves, does in your life and in my life. That's his purpose, to, re to restore us to our purpose, to restore us back unto God. We were created with a shared purpose to bless the world. It means everyone, the lens we look through, everyone has inherent value. And we were, we were meant to come together. That's one of the reasons this is so hard on us. We were meant to come together. To be a blessing together, a shared purpose to bless the world. The problem is, is that sin divides us and it thwarts our purpose. And by the way, the COVID virus is a result of sin. I'm not talking about human sin, though it could have been. I'm talking about all creation, all the disease is a result of the fallenness of human beings. And our view, here's our kingdom view. Our kingdom view from our kingdom is that people are not basically good. That is not our view. Our view is that people are basically selfish and prideful. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't do good things. They do good things because innately we all want to feel like we're good people. We all want to feel like we're innocent. So we do good things but we do it to protect our self-interest. And our natural bent is to violently protect our own self-interest. And you might say, well, I'm not a violent person. I would just remind you what Jesus said. When Jesus said, you've heard it said, do not murder, but I tell you, if you just call your brother stupid, you've done the same. It sounds violent to me. And even the best of us fall short of altruism. The answer does not lie with mankind. It does not lie with us finally learning that all you need is love. You realize that when they sang that, they broke up the very next year. But God will unite us and restore our purpose. Christ died to restore us first and foremost unto God himself, but secondly, to restore us with each other and to restore our purpose to be a blessing to the world. And though the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are, are phenomenal goals. I'm not saying anything against them. If you're from the kingdom of God, that's not your primary goal. Your primary goal is to be a blessing to others. Not to pursue happiness for yourself. By the way, they're linked. We are all different, yet we are, should be united in grace and love to serve our Lord and to advance the kingdom of God. Our purpose isn't to get our way, but be a blessing to the world who needs Jesus. So here, as I would come to a conclude, is my big idea. God created me to bless others. I want you to internalize that. God created me to bless others. If you, if you can close your eyes, I, just, I want you to contemplate that, even those of you at home. God created me to bless others. 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 That is our purpose. To be a blessing. And those of us that are from and part of the kingdom of God, that's our citizenship. That's what this series is about. What does it look like to be in the world 
but not of the world. What does it look like to live in a blue state, a red state? What does it look like to live in a multi-ethnic region or a monocultural region and be a blessing to others and a light for the Messiah who restored all things? Hopefully it will be a journey that you'll be blessed with, that we as a church in the Bay Area will be blessed with. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you that you created us. And you created us, dear Lord, with a purpose in mind, to glorify you and to be a blessing to others. Forgive us, Lord, for we have Christianized the American way oftentimes and just try to, to live a good life that benefits us. Forgive us for sugarcoating pride and selfishness. And help us, Lord, Help our original call, help our original nature to serve you and to be a blessing to others, be restored. Not by our might, not by our power, not by our self-will, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Will you show us the way, what it means to walk in the dust of the Master. I pray this in the name of Christ, our Messiah, our Lord, as well as our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. For those of it, uh, you that are here, if you have uh, early ed students, you'll go out and just pick them up the same way. Uh, elementary, you'll go out and go to the right. Please take your cup with you and throw it out in the trash can so somebody else doesn't have to pick it up. And uh, welcome to hang out and fellowship with one another. God bless.